Good morning. Um, uh, welcome to ICSS uh, Sunday morning program. Uh, my name is uh, Raj Sahai. Um, ICSS stands for Institute for Critical Study of Society. It was formed at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in 2004. So this year we'll be completing 20 years of this institute. And it was to preserve Marx's heritage and to support struggles for social justice and struggle for socialism leading to communism, uh, which is the only way you're going to get genuine social, uh, social justice. The opinions expressed in our forum are only of its authors, but we are all united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx who in his 11th thesis on Feuerbach said, quote, the philosophers have interpreted the world in different ways. The point, however, is to change it. So we live in today, we're living today in, uh, in a world with two major ongoing conflicts, very violent conflicts, one in Ukraine, the other in Palestine. The United States as the unipolar power is seriously challenged. Putin is now, as Stalin was during the Cold War, a target of organized imperialist propaganda. Stalin, the savior of us all, Jews in particular, in World War II was accused of anti-Semitism by Zionists soon after the formation of Israel and by Trotsky's followers. Today, defense of Israel's genocidal war on Gaza is being defended by Israel's supporters by accusing critics of Israeli genocide of Palestinians of anti-Semitism. But just as was the case with Stalin, so also now, Zionism stands condemned because it has betrayed uh, the Jews who stood for socialism, socialism itself, which was built in the USSR with important contribution of many Jews who did not betray it. Our speaker today is researcher, historian, and author, Professor Grover Fur of Montclair State University in New Jersey. His talk today is titled Paul Robeson, Stalin and the History of the Soviet Union. And it is based on his decades long research on Stalin or a history of the USSR. He's also presently writing another book, which will be published later this year. And I'll let him uh, tell you about it either now or during the comment section. Stalin died in 1953, then came Khrushchev's revisionism and his so called secret speech that Professor Fur exposed in his book, uh, a 2011 book titled Khrushchev Light. And since then, many other books following it, too numerous for me to take time to mention. His books have been translated into multiple languages around the world. I know four languages in India itself. Please join me in welcoming Professor Grover Fur. Grover is yours. Thank you. I'm just trying to rearrange the background here. Okay. Uh, thanks, Raj, for that very generous introduction, and I hope the sound is good for you all. The actual title of my talk is Paul Robeson Jr., Trotskyites and Anti-Stalinism. I expect it to take around 37 minutes. I'd just like to start by saying um, we, we, we are in sore need of an international uh, communist movements such as existed during Stalin's time now uh, to fight against uh, imperialism and colonialism. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the situation in Gaza, the genocide by, <clears throat> by the Israeli state against the Palestinians. Uh, the working class worldwide is suffering tremendously from the lack of a strong international movement. Okay, let me begin. In, in 1981, five years after his father's death, 
Paul Robeson Jr. made a startling claim. He wrote that when his father, Paul Sr., met with his old friend, Soviet Jewish poet, Itzik Feather, uh, in June 1949, Feather had told him something terrible, that famed Soviet theater director, Solomon Mikhoyles, had been murdered the previous year, quote, on Stalin's personal order, that he, Feffer, and other Jewish cultural figures were under arrest, and that they would all be executed. I had not, not heard this story before Bonnie Weiss told it to me in July 2023. I decided to research it. In September 2023, I published an article on it. On the basis of the evidence I found, I concluded that Paul Robeson Sr. could not possibly have told his son this story or anything like it, and that therefore Paul Jr. had invented the story. Here is a short passage from my article. Quote, Pfeffer could not have informed Paul Sr. that Mikhoyles had been murdered, quote, by Stalin's order, because this false version of Mikhoyles' death was not even hinted at until the late 1960s and not provided with spurious evidence until the 1990s. The fact that the first part of Paul Jr.'s story, the allegation that Pfeffer told Paul Sr. that Mikhoyles and his friend Golubov had been murdered, quote, at Stalin's order, cannot be true. This fact strongly suggests that the second part is false as well. Paul Jr. allegedly heard that Fe the Pfeffer story so shortly after his father's return from the Soviet Union in 1949, but did not tell it until 1981, 32 years later. In 1981, the false story that Mikhoyles had been murdered at Stalin's order was widely known. But the fact that Pfeffer himself was responsible for the arrests and charges against his colleagues in the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee was not known until it was published in 1994. Paul Jr.'s 1981 story, therefore, is consistent with his fabricating, deliberately or unconsciously, a story containing elements as they were known in 1981, but not in 1949." End quote. How did I go about researching this question? The answer is, I searched for evidence. I located the different versions of Paul Jr.'s story that are in his own words, not summaries by biographers or interviewers. I discovered that Paul Jr. kept changing his story over time. I discovered that the rumor that Stalin ordered the murder of Solomon Mikhoyles did not begin to circulate until the late 1960s. In 1949, Pfeffer could not have told Paul Sr. that Stalin had had Mikhoyles murdered. I discovered that the two sources of this rumor, Joseph Stalin's daughter Svetlana Aleluyeva and Nikita Khrushchev, changed their stories. Aleluyeva falsified her second memoir. Khrushchev's memoirs have been changed by others after his death. We cannot know what, if anything, Khrushchev really wrote about Mikhail's demise. I discovered that Itzik Pfeffer himself provided the evidence to the Soviet police that his own friends and associates in the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee had committed treason. It was Pfeffer's testimony that caused the arrest of his associates and himself. I uncovered the fact that the anti-Stalin researcher Vladimir Naumov, the one person who has been permitted to read the investigation materials on Pfeffer, stated that Pfeffer had not been physically mistreated by the Soviet police. Paul Sr. continued to honor and praise Stalin. He could never have done this if he had heard from his friend Pfeffer that Stalin had murdered Mikhoyles, falsely framed Pfeffer and his associates and planned their executions. Paul Jr. also claimed that, quote, Stalin personally, over a period of many years, was responsible for many anti-Semitic policies and acts, end quote. But Paul Jr. does not mention even a single such act. No wonder there were none. For decades, anti-communist researchers have been trying to find anti-Semitic acts by Stalin. Why? Because they want to equate communism with Nazism, the Soviet Union with Nazi Germany, and Stalin with Adolf Hitler. Hitler was an anti-Semite, so anti-communists fabricate stories that Stalin was also anti-Semitic. In our recent book, Stalin Exonerated, Vladimir Bobrov and I show that all such allegations are false. So what accounts for Paul Jr.'s false story? The answer is anti-Stalinism. This is what I'm gonna discuss with you today. In the spring of 1967, a friend and I were in Manhattan watching a gigantic march against the American invasion of Vietnam. 
we saw a contingent carrying the flag of the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, whom the anti-communists called Viet Cong. My friend remarked to me, quote, maybe we should march with that group. At this point, a gentleman standing behind us said to us, quote, you should not oppose the American war in South Vietnam. Why, we asked him. He replied, because the National Liberation Front is led by the Communist Party of Vietnam. The Communist Party of Vietnam is led by Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was trained in the Soviet Union by Joseph Stalin, and Stalin killed 20 million Americans. I didn't believe this, but I also did not disbelieve it either. I decided that at some point I would investigate the question of Stalin. In the early 70s, I read Robert Conquest's book, The Great Terror, Stalin's Purge of the 30s, which had been published in 1968. I was shocked by the many crimes and atrocities that Conquest claimed Stalin had committed. When I was established in my teaching job and was well along with my doctoral dissertation, I pursued this question of Stalin. During more than a year, I took the bus every week to Manhattan to visit the New York Public Library. There I checked the footnotes, more than a thousand of them, in Conquest's book. I made a file card for every footnote. A few years ago, I found that old card file from the mid 70s in my daughter's house in Newark, New Jersey. What I discovered was this, Conquest had no evidence for the charges of crimes and atrocities that he leveled at Stalin. He just quoted other books and articles that made these charges too. So I checked those sources. They too had no evidence, only assertions. Now, if expert A says a statement is true and expert B agrees with him, that is not evidence that the statement is true. This is the logical fallacy of argument from authority. Conquest's whole book is like that. Conquest was a master of anti-communist propaganda. It earned him the Medal of Freeman, Medal of Freedom from President George W. Bush. I realized that I would have to do some serious research to discover the truth about Stalin. I decided to start with the Tukhachevsky affair, the alleged military conspiracy involving Marshal Mikhail N. Tukhachevsky and seven other very high ranking military commanders who were arrested, tried and executed in 1937. It took me several years to research and draft an article. The academic readers for the journal Russian History finally accepted it. But then the publisher of that journal, a certain Charles Schlocks, refused to publish my article on the grounds that, quote, it made Stalin look good. Well, my article does no such thing. It's on my homepage, by the way. I merely concluded on the basis of the evidence available then that Stalin might or might not be guilty of framing Tukhachevsky and the rest. But Mr. Schlocks considered that unacceptable. This was my first encounter with what I now recognize as the anti-Stalin paradigm. My academic readers protested to the publisher and he finally yielded. But when I read the editor's introduction to the issue in which my article was published, I saw that he had written a paragraph introducing each article in that issue, except for my article, which he did not mention at all. The anti-Stalin paradigm had struck a second time. The anti-Stalin paradigm is the unwritten rule that no book or article in the field of Soviet history can find Stalin not guilty of any crime or atrocity of which he has been accused. Moreover, every book or article in this field must say something negative about Stalin, must accuse him of some crime or moral failing, or it will not be accepted for publication. This explains why Trotskyite research is readily accepted in the field of Soviet history. In order to be considered a Trotskyite in good standing by other Trotskyites, you have to condemn Stalin. Either echoing what Trotsky himself said, this is a cult after all, or inventing some new crime to accuse Stalin of. This Trotskyite practice conforms perfectly to the anti-Stalin paradigm. Uh, I will illustrate the falsity and political motivation that originated and sustains anti-Stalinism by citing some documents sent to me by a Trotskyite acquaintance. The first is a quotation from some other Trotskyite whom my acquaintance refuses to identify. 
quote, note that what Fur says in the email you forwarded is somewhat true. And he says this many times in his book, namely, my opponents do not cite evidence, but I do. This is because the evidence that the Moscow trials were fabricated and exacted through torture and intimidation was mostly published many years ago. Medvedev and Rogovin's books are among the last to do so. Since then, historians simply state that state these established facts without citing evidence, end quote. This is a lie. These are not established facts. This Trotskyite scholar cites no evidence that the Moscow trials are fabricated, that the defendants were tortured and intimidated. He just claims that this evidence was published long ago and that Roy Medvedev and Vadim Rogovin published it too. That is completely false. I have studied Rogovin's and Medvedev's books. They have no such evidence. The Trotskyite continues, quote, Tiplyakov, the Russian researcher, we'll get to him later, Tiplyakov accuses these neo-Stalinists of simply believing KGB files and Moscow trial testimonies without producing any evidence to the contrary because he doesn't think he needs to, like most historians. They consider this to be settled, end quote. This statement is true, but not in the way this Trotskyite thinks. Mainstream anti-communists and Trotskyites do not want to admit to others, or even to themselves perhaps, that they have no evidence whatever that the Moscow trials are fabrications, or that the defendants were tortured or threatened. But they want others to believe that they do have such evidence. So they just, quote, consider the matter to be settled, meaning, quote, we can state it without any evidence because only Stalinists would ever demand evidence. As in the following quotation, another quotation here. Neo-Stalinists are taking advantage of the fact that this is considered a closed debate in history and nobody but the Neo-Stalinists is willing to take a second look at it. The Stalinists ignore the evidence that was produced years ago and is rarely repeated these days, and they find new evidence from the archives that exonerates Stalin and his people. This is deliberately dishonest and what's more, incompetent. First, the charge by Trotskyites and other anti-communists that I am a Stalinist is false. Unlike the Trotskyites who are defending Leon Trotsky, unlike the mainstream, unlike the mainstream anti-communists who are defending capitalism, I am not defending Stalin. I am searching for the truth. I have been looking long and hard for decades for any real provable crime of Stalin. So far, I have not found even a single one. It is conceivable that someday I will find a genuine crime of Stalin. If and when I do, I will write about it. No Trotskyite or pro-capitalist anti-communist can honestly make a similar claim. Second, in history, no question is ever settled. No debate is ever closed. Historians must be ready to reconsider any conclusion if A, new evidence comes to light, or B, a more compelling interpretation of the current evidence is brought forth. That is what honest historians do. If the Trotskyite historian who wrote the words I quote above does not know this, he has no business writing or teaching history at all. If he does know it, he is deliberately lying to his readers, most of whom he no doubt hopes will not know it. Trotskyites, like all other anti-communists, are promoters of anti-communist bias. They write what I call propaganda with footnotes. They are not honest historians. One more quotation from this hapless Trotskyite. Quote, liberal bourgeois historians and Trotskyist ones, like Marie, Rogovin, and Bruet, all agree that the Moscow trials were show trials based on false testimonies. Well, the overtly pro-capitalist and Trotskyite historians agree with one another, true enough. But why don't the liberal bourgeois and Trotskyite historians identify the evidence that they claim is so convincing that it, quote, settles the question, closes the books on the Moscow trials? The answer is simple. This Trotskyite is lying. No such evidence exists. If he knows this, he's lying. If he does not know this, he has no business saying anything about Soviet history, much less teaching it. Some years ago, I published a book titled The Moscow Trials as Evidence. In it, I use primary source evidence 
to check the testimony of the Moscow trial's defendants. This method is essential for examining and drawing correct conclusions from historical evidence. But this method is no good for anti-communists, anti-Stalinists, and Trotskyites, because if you follow this method, you will inevitably discover that the Moscow trial's defendants did not give false testimony. On the contrary, on the evidence we now have, they were clearly guilty of at least those crimes to which they confessed. In fact, we can now prove with primary source evidence that some defendants were guilty of even more crimes, crimes they were not charged with and to which they never confessed. The evidence shows that famous anti-communist historians and Trotskyite historians have been lying about Stalin, about Trotsky and his crimes, about Soviet history. I have written two lengthy books in which I demonstrate using primary source evidence that Timothy Snyder of Yale and Stephen Kotkin of Princeton, both world famous historians, deliberately lied and falsified dozens of times each in their prize winning books on Stalin and the Stalin period of Soviet history. In 2023, my Moscow colleague Vladimir Babrov and I published a book titled Stalin Exonerated, Fact Checking the Death of Solomon Mikhoils. In that book, we prove that world-renowned scholars of Soviet history forged false documents to try to prove that Stalin ordered the murder of Mikhoils in January 1948. They did not even bother to cover the traces of their forgery. Very different drafts of the smoking gun document were published over several years. Anyone interested could have done what Vladimir and I did, compare the different versions of this supposedly archival document and discover that it was being changed. Some parts left out, other parts added, until it was finally inserted into an archive to so-called prove it is genuine. I am serious. The fakery is as blatant as that. Yet to this day, all so-called scholars of the Stalin period accept this blatantly faked document as proof that Stalin ordered Mikhoils to be murdered. My Trotskyite acquaintance also sent me an article by Alexei Georgievich Teplyakov, a Russian researcher on the Stalin period and a fervent anti-communist and lover of capitalism who hates Stalin. Tiplyakov writes, historians, quote, historians must refuse to trust the communists and agree with the priority of universal human values, the transition to a market economy and democracy, end quote. Universal human values, market economy, democracy? Tiplyakov certainly does not hide his bias, but why would a Trotskyite recommend this article? This is why. Trotskyism is parasitical upon mainstream anti-communist scholarship. Both Trotskyism and mainstream anti-communist pro-capitalist scholarship are viciously hostile to Stalin. Trotsky himself stopped at nothing in his hatred of Stalin. He conspired with his clandestine followers to murder Stalin and other Soviet leaders, sabotage Soviet industry, organize in unity with the Nazi high command, an uprising against the Soviet leadership, undermine and destroy the Comintern, and spy for the Nazis and Japanese fascists. I have published four books about Trotsky's lies and conspiracy. In them, I cite a great deal of primary source evidence. Chiplyakov is worried because the position prized by both Trotskyites and pro-capitalist anti-communists is being disproven by some scholars today. Tiplyakov cites some studies that disprove the capitalist Trotskyite falsehood of Stalinist terror. He urges that these works be opposed. Quote, this is Tiplyakov. The professional historical community should oppose to falsifiers, both historians and publicists, objective statistics and competent interpretation of the causes and consequences of Stalin's terror, end quote. A word about the concept of, quote, Stalinist terror. It's a lie. There was no Stalinist terror. American scholar Robert Thurston argued this as early as 1986 in an article in the mainstream journal Slavic Review. Tiplyakov is scandalized 
that the late Viktor Zimskov, a renowned Russian researcher, quote, stated that 97.5% of the population under Stalin were not subjected to repression in any form. Kiplyakov is shocked that Zimskov did not follow the capitalist and Trotskyite party line. He also complains that, quote, some historians have veered off into a defense of the open trials of the Stalinist era, that's the Moscow trials, reviving the darkest historiographic specters. Among such historians, Kiplyakov lists my colleagues Vladimir Bavrov and Sven Eric Holmstrom and myself. He complains that we and others, quote, promote the very explanatory models rejected by academic scholarship, namely a variety of exotic concepts based on reliance on Soviet sources, especially the materials of the Moscow trials of the 1930s. Note here that Teplyakov admits that reliance on Soviet sources is rejected by anti-communist scholars. Teplyakov also complains that Russian historian V.E. Bagdasaryan has exposed the mainstream Trotskyite conspiracy of lying about Stalin. Bagdasaryan writes, quote, despite the declaration of historiographical pluralism, this is in Russia, the theme of the great terror remains within the framework of an ideological taboo. A number of explanatory models of 1937 are simply not allowed in the field of academic science. Tiplyakov also complains about me, quote, the American literary critic G. Furr, who speaks from an extremely orthodox Stalinist position, assures us that Marshal Tukhachevsky and his accomplices in the 1937 trial of the military fascist conspiracy in the Red Army had criminal ties with both L.D. Trotsky and German and Japanese intelligence services. End quote. In 2021, Vladimir Bobrov, Sven Eric Holmstrom, and I published the book Trotsky and the Military Conspiracy. In it, we reproduce and study the evidence, including non-Soviet evidence, which proves Tukhachevsky and the other military conspirators did collaborate with Leon Trotsky and the German general staff to foment an anti-Soviet uprising in Leningrad with the, with the help of the German Air Force and to sabotage the Red Army in the event of, a, of an attack by Germany and or Japan on the Soviet Union. This evidence is, of course, anathema to anti-Stalinists, anti-communists, and Trotskyites. That's why persons like Tiplyakov complain about people who, quote, rely on Soviet sources. Tiplyakov cites some Russian historians who have also concluded that Tukhachevsky et al. were guilty, like M. N. Zdanovich, who writes, quote, the state security agency stopped this attempt in time, which could have resulted in something bloody. End quote. In 2017, General Alexander V. Bortnikov, head of Russia's FSB, the successor to the NKVD and KGB, stated in an official interview, this is quoting Bortnikov now, quote, archival materials indicate the presence of an objective side in a significant part of criminal cases, including those that form the basis of the well-known public trials, that is, the Moscow trials. The plans of L. Trotsky's supporters to remove or even liquidate Stalin and his associates, the leadership of the All-Union Communist Party Bolshevik, are by no means fiction, as are the connection of the conspirators with foreign intelligence services. Tiplyakov notes that Russian historian Alexander N. Dugin, who was published in Vavrosi Histori, the most prestigious historical journal in Russia, quote, calls our Medvedev, our Conquest, and D. Volkoganov, pseudo-historians, end quote. Dugan is correct. Notice that this is the same Medvedev that the Trotskyite historian whom I quoted a few minutes ago recommended as one of those who supposedly proved that the Moscow trials were frame-ups. The Trotskyite website, wsws.org, has called me a, quote, pseudo-historian. No wonder. I base my research on evidence not in swearing allegiance to a cult. So therefore, in the view of Trotsky ice, there must be something wrong with me. Dugan also rejects the mainstream position that the Soviets shot the 11,000 or more Polish prisoners in what is known as the Katyn massacre. In 2018, I published a book length study of Katyn. In it, I show that the evidence is consistent only with German, 
not Soviet guilt. For daring to write this, I was expelled from the H. Poland mailing list run by Michigan State University. The list managers refused to reinstate me. Kristina Turkowska, a Polish nationalist historian, and Dr. Yaroslav Szarek, president of the Polish Institute of National Remembrance, a right-wing nationalist and racist organization supported by the Polish government, both wrote to the president and trustees of my university to complain about my research. That book of mine has now been published in French, Russian, and Polish. Professor Dugan has written, quote, many modern historians accuse Stalin of all mortal sins and attribute to him the inhuman idea of accelerated industrialization by means of merciless exploitation of the peasants, the seizure of even seed grade from them, which led to multi-million victims of famine in the early 30s. This version is nothing more than an invention of incompetent publicists or historians, end quote. In 2011, I published Khrushchev Live, in which I demonstrated that in Nikita S. Khrushchev's world-changing secret speech to the 20th Party Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on February 25th, 1956, not a single one of the accusations of crimes or misdeeds by Stalin or by Lavrenti Beria is true. 60 of the 61 such accusations by Khrushchev are provably false, while the 61st cannot be proven either false or true. Since that book, I have researched other accusations against Stalin by Khrushchev's men and then by Gorbachev's men. So far, not a single one of these accusations can be supported by evidence. Most of those I have studied are, both, are provably both false and dishonest, intended to deceive. Alexander Yakovlev. Alexander N. Yakovlev was Mikhail Gorbachev's right-hand man on questions of ideology. Gorbachev met him years before he became the leader of the Soviet Union and promoted him to the Politburo. Ten years after the end of the Soviet Union, Yakovlev admitted that he, along with others whom he did not identify, had a decades-long conspiracy to put an end to socialism in the Soviet Union. Here is what Yakovlev said about his conspiracy. This is Yakovlev in 2002. Quote, after the 20th Congress, in an ultra narrow circle of our closest friends and like-minded people, we often discussed the problems of democratization of the country and society. We chose a method as simple as a sledgehammer to propagate the ideas of the late Lenin. It was necessary to clearly, succinctly, and distinctly isolate the phenomenon of Bolshevism, separating it from Marxism of the last century. That is why we tirelessly talked about the, quote, genius of, the, of late Lenin, about the need to return to Lenin's, quote, plan for building socialism through cooperation, through state capitalism, and so on. A group of real, not imaginary reformers developed, orally, of course, the following plan to strike at Stalin, at Stalinism, with Lenin's authority. And then, in the case of success, to beat Lenin with Pelkhanov and social democracy and with liberal, liberalism and moral socialism to beat revolutionaryism in general. A new round of exposure of the, quote, cult of personality of Stalin began, but not with an emotional cry as Khrushchev did, but with a clear implication, the criminal is not only Stalin, but the system itself is criminal. The Soviet totalitarian regime could only be destroyed through glasnost and the totalitarian discipline of the party while hiding behind the interests of improving socialism, end quote. Yakovlev then gave his, Yakovlev's definition of Bolshevism. It's pretty long, here are a few sentences. This is Yakovlev in 2002. From a historical point of view, Bolshevism is a series of social insanity when the peasants, the nobility, the merchants, the entire layer of entrepreneurs, the clergy, intellectuals, and intelligentsia were physically destroyed. It is the exploitation of man and ecological vandalism based on all types of oppression. These are anti-human precepts hammered in with the ruthlessness of ideological fanaticism that hides pettiness. 
It is a landmine of monstrous power that almost blew up the whole world. And one more sentence from Yakovlev, quote, internationally, it, that's Bolshevism, is a phenomenon of the same order with German Nazism, fascism, Spanish Francoism, and Paul Pottism. This rabid anti-communist Yakovlev became one of the most influential figures in Gorbachev's regime. Yakovlev approved the avalanche of anti-Stalin books and articles that appeared during Gorbachev's years in office. It's possible that Gorbachev himself was part of the conspiracy against socialism that Yakovlev boasts about, though I can't prove. I've researched a number of books and articles published during the Gorbachev-Yakovlev years. They are full of deliberate lies, statements that can be proven false with the documents from former Soviet archives that have been released in large numbers since the 1990s. The publisher's introduction to Alexander Dugin's forthcoming book, which is titled Yezhov versus Stalin. It has the same title by coincidence as my 2019 book, uh, states, quote, we can now state with absolute confidence a completely obvious fact. The historiography of the Soviet period of our history has been deliberately and purposefully distorted and falsified for a long time, end quote. Tiplyakov quotes with distaste other historians who have begun to expose the lies about Stalin and to describe, using primary source evidence, what really did happen in the Soviet Union during the period of Stalin's leadership. However, rejection of the phony concepts of Stalinism and Stalinist terror and demonstration that the so-called crimes alleged against Stalin are disproven by the primary source evidence is occurring only in Russia where there is a little space in academic history for honest historians to disprove the lies about Stalin, although anti-Stalinism remains the dominant force, even in Russia. But in the West, it is still taboo to say anything positive about Stalin, even disproving with evidence false accusations of some crime of which Stalin has been accused is rarely tolerated. This is the anti-Stalin paradigm. ways of not knowing. Anti-Stalinism, whether of the mainstream anti-communist and pro-capitalist variety or its parasitical servant Trotskyism, is not a way of learning the history of the Soviet Union of the Stalin period. Rather, it is a way of not knowing, of hiding one's eyes from the truth, as demonstrated by primary source evidence. It is like the proverbial ostrich burying its head in the sand so as not to see something unpleasant. I have been informed by people who should know that in reality, ostriches are too intelligent to do this. However, Trotskyites and anti-communists are not too intelligent to do it, and they want us to do it too. Trotskyites do not want to know the truth because the truth dismantles the Trotsky cult. And let us make no mistake about it. Trotskyism is a cult in the true sense of the word. If you base your research on evidence, you'll be cast out of the charmed circle of the Trotskyites. In the West, the Trotskyites have a network that helps their fellow cultists find academic jobs and get published. A historian who is determined to base his or her conclusions about Stalin and so-called Stalinism on private primary source evidence will almost certainly not be hired anywhere. The gatekeepers are all mainstream anti-communists or in some cases, Trotskyites. Two different mainstream historians of the Soviet Union have each told me on different occasions, quote, Grover, your research is good, but you have to say something negative about Stalin. If you do not, your research, no matter how good it is, will not be taken seriously, end quote. This is the anti-Stalin paradigm at work. But I am not writing for the mainstream historical profession, or of course, for the Trotskyite cult. I could never get a job teaching Russian or Soviet history. The articles and books that I write would not be acceptable to mainstream history journals or academic publishers. I teach English literature. My job does not depend on kowtowing to the strictures of the corrupt field of study that is Soviet history. I am writing for persons like you, people who recognize that an accurate history of the Soviet Union during the period of Joseph Stalin's leadership is vitally important for any understanding of world history of the 20th century. I am writing for persons who understand that primary source evidence, 
not the opinions of experts, no matter how famous they are, is the only way to discover the truth. That is so in all scientific fields, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, astronomy, and so on. It is true in history too, but the history of the Soviet Union is not firmly founded on evidence-based research. In the study of the high politics during the period of Stalin's leadership, anti-communist politics come first. Evidence-based research has to fit itself into the Procrustean bed of the anti-Stalin paradigm or it will not be published. Trotskyite historians are tolerated, even encouraged, as a minor voice in mainstream Soviet, Soviet historiography. Trotskyites can get jobs teaching Soviet history. They provide a false left cover for lies about Stalin and the Stalin period. But so-called Stalinists are not tolerated. Down the rabbit hole. On the first page of Lewis Carroll's masterpiece, Alice in Wonderland, we read that Alice was daydreaming. Quote, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her, Alice started to her feet. Burning with curiosity, she was just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole. In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was to get out again, end quote. Alice falls a long way down. At the bottom, she starts to speak but soon stops and says, quote, this is Alice, oh dear, what nonsense I'm talking. This is what it means to quote, go down the rabbit hole. This expression is often used about supporters of Donald Trump because they believe the most incredible falsehoods. In their case, the rabbit hole is the network of far right-wing sites and apps on the internet. Trump supporters get all their information from these sources. So they are completely out of touch with reality. The same thing is true about Trotskyism and most mainstream Soviet scholarships. Scholarship. They ignore, even attack primary source evidence if it does not conform to their own preconceived anti-Stalin, anti-communist, and or pro-Trotsky falsehoods. The difference is that unlike Alice herself, they do not realize that they are talking nonsense. And they certainly do not want the rest of us to realize it. Their job is to mystify and mislead everyone who sees that capitalism is a terrible inhuman system that requires racism, sexism, mass murder, war, and the exploitation and the human misery it inevitably causes. And people who see that and who are attracted to the idea of communism. Many such people begin to look at the history of the Soviet Union during the period of Stalin's leadership. They see a desperately poor country largely destroyed by the world by the world war the anti-communist civil war a devastating typhus epidemic and four deadly famines during the 1920s alone they see that under the leadership of stalin and the bolshevik party the country industrialized without foreign capital using only the labor and ingenuity of the soviet working class and peasantry collectivized agriculture putting an end to the centuries-long cycle of murderous famines framed and armed its military to the point that the Soviet people defeated the invading fascist forces, the largest and best army that had ever existed. Even a liberal anti-communist like the economist Paul Krugman recognized these achieve recognizes these achievements. In 2002, in the New York Times, Krugman wrote, quote, indeed, in the 1950s and even into the 1960s, many people around the world saw Soviet economic development as a success story. A backward nation had transformed itself into a major world power, end quote. They see that the Soviet people did all this while uncovering and defeating deadly conspiracies led by Trotskyists and other oppositionists aimed at overthrowing the Soviet government and turning large parts of the country over to Nazi Germany and fascist Japan. I have summarized here only a small part of this magnificent history. The late historian Moshe Lewin an anti-Stalinist, but one who had grown up in the Soviet Union, called the 20th century, quote, the Soviet century. What might discourage thoughtful persons from studying this history in order to learn what the Soviet working class did that was correct, that led towards a socialist society, and what they did that, that turned out to be incorrect, mistakes that, when compounded, ultimately led to the reversal of all the gains and a return to predatory capitalism. This is the job of anti-Stalin pseudo-scholarship, 
to falsify Soviet history and particularly that of Stalin and the period of his leadership so as to discourage as many people as possible from learning the lessons of Soviet socialism. This is also the job of the Trotskyite cultists who repeat without evidence the anti-Stalin lies of the overtly anti-communist apologists for capitalism, trying to lead as many people as possible down the dead end of the Trotskyite rabbit hole. Conclusion, it is good to be attacked by the enemy. The class struggle is also waged in the field of history. It is a struggle for the truth as established by the best, best primary source evidence. The anti-Stalinists, both mainstream and Trotskyite, oppose this struggle for truth with all their might. Berthold Brecht wrote, quote, he who struggles can lose. He do, who does not struggle has already lost, end quote. The famous French Marxist historian, Lucien Febvre, titled one of his books, Combat pour l'histoire, Struggles for History. We must struggle for the truth of the history of the Soviet Union during its heroic period, the Stalin period. The Trotskyist, Trotskyites and their overtly anti-communist mainstream historians will continue to attack those of us who struggle for the truth. Mao Zedong, one of the great communists of the last century, one of the greatest communists of the last century, wrote in 1939, quote, I hold that it is bad as far as we are concerned if a person, a po political party, an army or a school is not attacked by the enemy. For in that case, it would definitely mean that we have sunk to the level of the enemy. It is good if we are attacked by the enemy, since it proves that we have drawn a clear line of demarcation between the enemy and ourselves. It is still better if the enemy attacks us wildly and paints us as utterly black without a single virtue. It demonstrates that we have not only drawn a clear line of demarcation between the enemy and ourselves, but achieved a great deal in our work, end quote. This applies to historical research too. When those of us who are seeking the truth about Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union during the period of his leadership are attacked by anti-communists and Trotskyites, when we have drawn some blood from these historical fakers and liars, we can be assured that we have achieved something in our work. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer the question. Thank you, Grover. Um, so, um... We you have also broken our record, other records, which is today we have reached uh, attendance of 100. Right now it's 98. And uh, so we're going to go into questions of common period. But before we do that, let me tell you what's coming up. Yep. On, um, um, on uh, April 7th, we will have Claudia and Karina who are launching a campaign for vote socialist in 2024. And these uh, two activists will be with us on the 7th of April. On the following, uh, uh, on the uh, afterwards, on uh, 14th, we're going to have, uh, uh, going to have Dan Kowalik, who has just been to um, observe elections in Donbass in Russia and Donbass in particular. And he will be speaking the title of which is Woke and War Crazed, Western Liberal Support of Ukraine. So he will be speaking here on the 14th. And then on the 21st, uh, we're going to have um, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the 21st here. Uh, maybe Alan can step up and I thought I had it here. That'll uh, be um, Anne Garrison talking about the, the on the anniversary of the Rwanda um, uh, genocide that took place. So that's okay. uh, April 21st, Anne Garrison. Okay, thank you, Alan. So, um, so now we'll go to questions and common spirit and I expect a lot of hands. So let's set the ground rule here, which will we'll strictly follow. First of all, uh, it's a respectful uh, communicate uh, uh, dialogue here. Uh, people are reminded that to each one person who, no matter how strongly dis disagree with the other, 
maintain uh, uh, respect for the other person. The second is your time limit for question or comment from the audience is two minutes. And I, I'll ask Alan to please strictly observe that. And as they approach two minutes, let them know it's 15 seconds remaining and then cut it off if they don't stop at two minutes because otherwise we'll be unfair to others. So I don't know who raised their hands first, but in my list, uh, first is Robert, second is Bill Meyer, third one is Carla, and fourth is Eugene Rule. So let's go with these four. After that is Ben. So let's, Robert, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so delighted to have heard Grover Fur again speak on his research. Um, I have a question for you, Professor Fur, which is that um, in, this, in the late 60s and early 70s, the Trotskyites, one of the things they said is that Stalin was not an intellectual. Uh, what's your, um, what's your response? <laughs> what's your response to that, to that question? Well, I don't know. I guess it's name calling, right? Um, but it is true that uh, Lenin and Trotsky and other Bolsheviks who lived in exile, I mean, not in, well, well, they were in exile, they were in Western Europe, uh, <clears throat> did have the opportunity to master several foreign languages. Uh, Stalin had a reading knowledge, according to himself, of German and English, but not a spoken knowledge. He, of course, spoke his native language, uh, Georgian and Russian. Um, he wrote a lot, but he certainly, you know, he certainly did not have the kind of uh, advanced education that some of the other Bolsheviks had. So, I mean, I would say, so what? I mean, Stalin was, uh, was uh, involved in political organizing. Um, I think that uh, Trotsky, if I recall correctly, made that statement uh, in the context of saying that that Stalin or implying that Stalin was of a limited intelligence. And, you know, that's that's absurd. Okay, so before I go to Bill Maher, I just wanted to add Stalin definitely was among the top intellectuals uh, of the party. His work on the national and colonial question was praised by Lenin and it's probably one of the most important work after Lenin's work uh, in the world communist movement and liberation of the third world. So uh, the second person who raised hand was Bill, I think, but I don't see his hand. So we'll go to Carla and we'll come back to uh, Bill. Robert, please lower your hand unless you want to raise hand for a second round. Carla, please go ahead. Hello. Richard, I, I my hand has not been recognized yet. Oh, okay, uh, uh, okay, Richard. Okay, sorry. Uh, Ro uh, okay, I was I meant to Robert. I, I yeah, I'm only start was saying this to Robert. His hand is up, but that's okay. I can lower the, his hand because he's already spoken. Carla, please go ahead. Yeah, I recognize your hand, Richard. Thank, Thank you. you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I didn't really compose this question. Um, I'm just, you know, very well, but so there are these different splits in like the workers movement, I guess we can call it the, um, the movement of fighting back um, against capitalism. So we have, we still have these splits that are a carryover from the Soviet Union. And how, um, what can we do about these splits? Um, you know, like, especially in a time like now when we see all this international solidarity to fight back um, <laughs> against, for example, the war, but we have these splits and, um, well, I guess one part is, do you see how the splits are um, playing out right now, how they're hurting us, or does it is it destined to mean that um, this is going to like, going to continue to be a battle like you know in the future is there some is this something that can be resolved and how how it would be resolved how could it be resolved that's a lot right this, so is it clear yeah i guess so um it's not directly on the i mean i'm going to steer it towards the subject of my talk 
which is that we have to stand up for the truth. I mean, I think we have to stand up for the historical truth, and what means we have to stand up for the historical truth as it's as it's uh, um, derived from the best evidence that we have. That's what you do in a court of law. That's what you do if you're trying to solve a mystery. That's what the scientists do in every scientific field, as I mentioned in my talk. I think you have to stand up for that. And unfortunately, there are people who describe themselves as being on the left uh, who don't do that. Um, and um, and there are others who, you know, who are overtly pro-capitalist who don't do it either. Um, and so the fight for the truth about the history of the Soviet Union, I think, uh, is a, a vital part, is an essential part of eventually forming some sort of unity uh, in order to uh, combat specific acts of brutality and horror by the capitalists, as in Gaza, as in Ukraine, uh, or, um, or building a new revolutionary worldwide movement. You have to stand on the basis of the truth not on the basis of, of a preconceived ideas, whether they're pro-capitalist ideas and pro-Trotskyist ideas. And that's really what I try to do in my research. And let me just say one more thing uh, to, for the, to, to uh, add to my answer to the previous uh, question about whether Stalin was an intellectual. Uh, there's been quite a bit written now about Stalin's reading and his, um, his library. There's one book by Jeffrey Roberts in English about Stalin's library. Uh, Roberts uh, is not a fan of Stalin, but he has great respect for his, for his uh, intellectual capacity, his ability to read the tremendous amounts of, of material and, and assimilate it and comment on it. And there have been a couple of books in Russian as well that preceded Roberts' book. Uh, also by anti-communists, but people who recognized that Stalin had a, a prodigious intellect. I don't know why that skipped my mind when I was answering your question, but I wanted to insert that information now. Okay. Bill Mayer is next. Sorry, I hadn't seen you ahead. Uh, so Bill, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, this is a real treat to be on a Zoom with uh, Grover Fur. I've been reading your books since uh, Khrushchev uh, lied, changed my life. I mean, it was so, so unique, uh, a really well-researched book. And so I've got so many questions for you over the years. I haven't had a chance to ever talk to you, but let me just throw two at you here. Um, <clears throat> there was a director named Sergei Leznitsa who made a movie called The Trial, which is about the Moscow trial. And uh, I don't know if you've ever done movie reviews, but I would love to see you do some of reviews of some of his films that are definitely in your area of study. Uh, he made another movie called The Trial I mean, another movie called State Funeral, which is about um, Stalin's funeral. And these are based on the archival footage of, that came out at that time. And it's pretty basically put forward with the archival footage with no narration on top of it. So I don't really know what his purpose was to prove that something was wrong or what, but I, I would love to see your reaction to it if you can ever check that out and write on that. But the second one is recently a book came out called Red Famine uh, yeah. and uh, Applebaum. And I assume you know all about that too. They're trying, trying to actually uh, praise Stalin for the fact that he didn't kill all those people on purpose. Uh, so they're softening a little bit. Uh, what's your opinion? Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, there is a researcher in the United States named uh, Mark Tauger, who teaches at West Virginia University, teaching there his whole career who is the world's expert, in my opinion, on Russian and Soviet agriculture, and <laughs> including the famine. Um, I, in my book, Blood Lies, I spend two chapters um, early in the book on the question of the famine. And in them, I summarize a lot of Tauger's research and I put the footnotes to the actual uh, research by Tauger, so you can look it up. Um, and in my book, uh, Stalin Waiting for the Truth, which is uh, about uh, Stephen Kotkin's uh, second volume of his biography of Stalin, uh, the, the, uh, I have a whole chapter on uh, Mark Tauger's research, again with uh, footnotes. And uh, Tauger 
uh, has done the primary research on the famine. Calgar also has uh, a couple of really good essays uh, on other views of the famine, including a very powerful uh, essay uh, debunking and disproving uh, Anne Applebaum's book, Red Famine. That is on the History News Network, HNN. I'm not sure what the, uh, anyway, History News Network, Tauger, Applebaum will bring it up in the Google search, or you can email me and I can send it to you. But it's really very powerful. And um, talk about the, let me just say something about the anti-Stalin paradigm, which I talked about in my, in my address. Um, Tauger was invited by the editors of Kritika, K-R-I-T-I-K-A, which is one of the main um, mainstream so uh, journals that does Soviet and Russian history. They invited him to write a, um, a review essay on Applebaum's book when it came out. And Tauger wrote a very powerful review essay. It was so powerful and so devastating that Kritika, which refused, which, who invited him to publish it, refused to publish it. Uh, he sent me a copy of it and it's really, really powerful. So he, he shortened it. I don't think he really toned it down much, but he shortened it and published it on History News Network. But you know, there's a difference. History News Network is a, is a popular uh, kind of venue for people to write about history, historical topics. A Critica is part of the, uh, you know, the apparatus of the of the mainstream Soviet history. So they wouldn't let this kind of, of devastating criticism of Applebaum's uh, book be published, even though he had invited him to write it. Uh, Applebaum, of course, is a very influential person. She writes for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all kinds of magazines. She's very dishonest. She's married to a right-wing Polish uh, diplomat, a professional anti-communist, you could say. Not a stupid person, but not an honest person. I hope that's helpful. Okay. Ben K., you are next. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ben uh, Ben Kavanaugh from the C Communist Party of Great Britain, uh, Marxist Leninist, and in, in uh, I'm in Scotland. Um, so thanks very much for the talk, Grover. I found that very interesting. Uh, my, my question, I have a question. That is, um, so Stalin was such a revered and respected and dare say loved leader in the USSR, and the USSR achieved so much uh, under under his leadership. How come there wasn't a larger um, fight back or resistance uh, against against this slander, against against these lies, you know, and or at least why didn't why didn't we hear about them? Um, how were they hidden? Um, is there a reference that you would recommend that best explains the apparent lack of resistance? And uh, secondly, um, did the losses of the most committed Bolsheviks during World War II have an impact? on this lack of resistance uh, against the slander and lies against Stalin. Because I, one of the things I always wonder is whether the uh, US imperialism actually did achieve its aim in the sense that they killed 27 million people. And among those 27 were the most committed, the most talented, the most ardent uh, Bolsheviks. And in that, you know, in that having that, having the result that it was more, it was easier it was more possible to do what Khrushchev did. What do you think about that? Thank you. Well, briefly, I've, of course, thought about this question. Um, I think you have to, I mean, the bigger question of which this is a part of it is, you know, where did, where did, where did the reversal of the development towards, uh, towards communism take place. Uh, one way of looking at that is, you know, when I wrote the book Khrushchev Live, where did Khrushchev come from? Khrushchev was a major senior party leader for a couple of decades during Stalin's time. Um, how could a person like that have become so influential? Uh, when Khrushchev gave his speech, his secret speech, uh, all of the 
national and regional and uh, some of the local party leaders were there. And there was no upsurge of, of protest uh, against them, against what he said. And many of them must have known because they were around in the 1930s. Many of them must have known that uh, much of what Khrushchev was saying was false. So if we want to look for the um, roots of revisionism, if you want to put it that way, uh, the roots of the uh, ultimate turn to the, of the Soviet Communist Party towards market economy and ultimately towards capitalism, uh, I think we have to go back uh, at least to the 1930s. Now, part of that is this uh, uh, issue of the, let's just take the Soviet constitution, which I wrote about somewhere or other, and the, um, the Soviet constitution 1936 provided for uh, citizens groups to put forth candidates. The idea was to have, to have a, uh, you know, local groups that would put forth candidates uh, to run for the Supreme Soviet to essentially give all power to the Soviets, which was the Bolshevik uh, cry in 1917. And Stalin was not able to, to win the party leadership, uh, to party leaders to that. So um, in my two-part article in 2005, Stalin and the struggle for democratic reform, I mean, the struggle for democratic reform was lost, but it was a, but a lot more than that was lost too. So by the time Stalin died, I think Stalin was, was politically among the leadership Stalin was isolated. Uh, there are, you know, there are anecdotal stories of, of, of individuals who protested the, uh, uh, you know, Khrushchev's secret speech. And of course, there was a, a rebellion of a kind in uh, in, uh, in in Georgia. But um, I think by the by the time Khrushchev gave that speech, uh, the party leadership had been won away from Stalin's party. So that includes, of course. Uh, relying on the masses. And of course, one of the things I talk about in that book and that article is that um, the party leaders uh, had uh, become uh, a, a kind of separate caste. They had, they had uh, great privileges. And I think that's a lesson we have to learn for the future is the party leaders should not be allowed privileges and should not be allowed to build their own fiefdoms in a certain area over a long period of time so that everybody in that area believes that, that the party is identified with that particular local leader. So those are some ideas that I have. I know that's far from a, from a satisfactory uh, answer to your question, which is a very big question. Next will be Jeet Rule, followed by Elazar. Oh, okay, well, thanks so much, uh, uh, Grover. It's great to see you again and listen to you. And you've done so much in clarifying our views of Stalin and the Soviet Union. It's really, really important because we can't really understand the 20th century, much less the 21st century, without this understanding. Yes. Uh, along those lines, I don't know if you know this um, book by Al Shemansky here. Um, I'm holding it up here. It's titled, Is the Red Flag Flying? Mm -hmm. And Szymanski does some, I think, a really interesting and important work in clarifying our understanding of the Stalin and the, well, he dealt with the post-Stalin period. But the thing is, he, he um, what he did is he used the work of bourgeois Sovietologists, but then put them in a different framework. And he examined uh, political processes and his uh, conclusions were essentially that the uh, uh, party in the Soviet Union did indeed represent the interests of the working class. It recruited working class members. It listened to the complaints of the working class and it acted on them and uh, uh, corrected its policy according to what the workers said. And it, indeed, the material improvements 
of the uh, you know guaranteed rights. I mean, the Soviet Union had an equal rights clause in its constitution, which we do not have here uh, in the United States. So um, I, I just I really found his work fairly important in clarifying this. And I don't know if you know of this book, other, uh, but other, I hope you do, and I am sure. Uh, other people should know about it. It's a very good, worthwhile book. So I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Well, I have read the book. I do have a copy and I did read it, but it was a long time ago. Um, so he, and there are some other books like that too. Uh, there's How the Soviet Union was uh, was Ruled, How the Soviet Union is Governed by Jerry Hoff, who retired, I think he even died not long ago from uh, Duke, um, which kind of, takes the Brezhnev period, you know, sort of a, a slice, as you want, of time and looks at the party in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, just in, in, in that, at that one moment of time. And of course, many of the uh, benefits to the working class uh, that dated from a previous era uh, were captured in those works. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I haven't checked all of his footnotes and so forth. I didn't do that, but, um, but in that sense, I think you can see that, um, uh, that uh, there were many, uh, benefits that the Bolsheviks and the Soviet people had won under socialism that remained at that time, about, about the late 1970s. Um, what you don't get from works like that is the dynamic picture. In other words, what was the direction of development? And we can see that uh, there's something seriously wrong, just speaking about the party, which isn't the leadership, something seriously wrong with a party that would make somebody like Nikita Khrushchev a major leader. Stalin was very concerned in 1937, and this, this book is published, this, this is, been published for a long time. Uh, his, his Stalin's speech to the February March 1937 Central Committee fled him. Part of it has, was published almost immediately. It's in English, where he says that uh, that the party leaders are very weak in Marxism Leninism. We're going to have um, a program where all party leaders are going to be going to have to appoint um, uh, lieutenants, people who will take their place while they come to Moscow and attend classes in Marxism Leninism. And the higher up the, uh, the ladder of, uh, of party leaders you go, uh, the longer the time they're going to have to come to uh, Moscow to attend these classes. And he's very upfront, he's very outspoken about it. He says, this is what's gonna happen. It never happened. It didn't happen. We don't know why it didn't happen, but we can guess the party leaders didn't wanna do that. Uh, they didn't want to increase their um, their literacy in Marxism Leninism. Uh, Stalin promoted the book the Sh uh, History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Bolshevik short course, which included, of course, a famous chapter on on dialectics. Uh, he spent a tremendous amount of effort on that. And by the way, he uh, there's a lot written about that. He he cut out uh, the draft that was written by. Uh, Two others that he invited to write the draft had all kinds of glowing praise about Stalin himself in that book, and Stalin cut it out. He just ruthlessly cut all that, almost all of that stuff out. He excised it. He said, "This is not what we want in this. This is a textbook for communists." Stalin also uh, sponsored and put great store in the um, the uh, textbook of political economy. Uh, when he, uh, this is after World War II. There were there was some work on it before World War II, but particularly after World War II, uh, uh, he invited uh, uh, Dmitry Shapilov, uh, to who was one of the one of the top Soviet uh, ideologists to be the uh, to to organize the effort to write a uh, textbook on political economy. This, of course, would be for for you know, higher schools and for the party leaders. And Shapilov said, oh, no, I don't want to do it. I'm, you know, I'm so busy. I've got other things to do. And Stalin, according to Shapilov, Stalin told him, listen, if we don't have this book, 
I, you know, he said to Shapilov, do you want communism? Shapilov said, yes, of course. And Stalin said, if we don't have this book, there isn't going to be any communism. So Stalin had an understanding that the, that the, the, uh, the ideological uh, development of the party leaders as a group uh, was, was very low. And that produced Khrushchev, it produced Brezhnev, it produced, you know, and lots of other people below them too. So some process was going on uh, in the 1930s uh, that produced this result, that uh, the, the, uh, a leadership that was not dedicated to the uh, principles of, of, of communism. And of course, we need to investigate that. But uh, I don't think that Shemansky gets at that by taking this, you know, uh, one period of time and just taking a static look at what the Soviet Union was like at that time. Remember why I read that quotation from Yakovlev. Yakovlev said he and some other like-minded people that fairly high up in the party leadership, even at that time in 1956, formed this conspiracy to get rid of socialism. These people came to power. How did somebody like Gorbachev come to power in the Soviet Union? Okay, he was a, an enemy of socialism. Yakovlev was his right-hand man. There had to be something wrong. And I don't think that those books that you, the one you mentioned, the one I mentioned captured that at all. Okay, so I, I have missed uh, Richard Koritz, but uh, let's put, uh, Richard, you come after Elazar because I already announced Elazar will be next. So Elazar, go ahead. El Elazar, can you, followed can by- Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you uh, hear, can you hear uh, me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you, oh. but one second. Oh. After Lazar, right. Richard Koritz. Okay, go ahead, Lazar. Yeah. Well, I was prepared for a very different type of uh, presentation because it talked about Paul Robeson and the Soviet Union, and so I want to just focus on. First of all, I want to give some concepts of what I consider the real Trotskyist view of Stalin. I don't think Stalin was anti-Semitic. I don't think he was uneducated. I've read a great deal of his literature. He had some very profound ideas, but he what bothered touchy-feely intellectuals is that Stalin knew how to express himself in a way that made it understandable to a worker or a peasant. So he could take con complex ideas and bring them down to earth. So the, what I call Trotskyism is not what Grover calls Trotskyites. I'm glad he's using that term because that goes together with Trotskyite wrecker, fascist. I consider all that bogus, but okay. The section of Trotskyism I was in was led by Howard Taylor, former Communist Party member who was in the party when they were readmitting the Japanese that they kicked out. Now he and Leo Robinson of the Communist Party forged a United Front action at Pier 80 to stop the unloading of an apartheid cargo in the Ned Lloyd Kimberley. Those are the kind of Trotskyists I worked with. They were openly willing to work and build United Fronts with Stalinists. Another great Stalinist to me is John Corrin. But I'm going to go back now to this question of why uh, there is nine seconds, though. We are nearly well, out of two minutes. Well, I want to talk about what Pfeffer said. It was common knowledge in the Jewish Anti Fascist Committee, not necessarily true, that Stalin ordered the death of Michals. Paris Marcus wrote a poem and spoke, gave the eulogy at the Moscow Yiddish Theater and alluded to the state security forces killing Michals. So Grover said that was in the 60s. I sent a copy of the poem by Paris Marcus, who himself was executed. When, when Pfeffer met with Robeson, he was already under arrest. All these people were executed. Now, Fur never said before that they were guilty. I yeah, agree that um, okay. Pfeffer was a stool pigeon. Let it's let uh, one thirty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let him speak for twenty nine minutes. <laughs> yeah. Let uh, let uh, uh, let our speaker respond to it. Grover, please go ahead. Respond to it. Uh, well, it wasn't a question. 
Um, okay. I'm not defending the Communist Party USA. I guess that's partly what LSR is uh, okay. concerned with. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I take responsibility for the article that I researched and wrote about Paul Robeson Jr. I have lots of evidence there. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really sure where our disagreements specifically are, but uh, insofar as Elazar is critical of the Communist Party expelling the Japanese and so forth, well, sure, um, me too. Uh, I'm not defending everything or really anything that the Communist Party USA did. I'm not talking about the Communist Party USA. So I don't, other than that, I don't want to, I don't want to assume or presume that I know what uh, is in Elazar's mind here. And so I'd rather just leave it at that. Okay, so we'll go to the next person. That's uh, Richard, Richard Koritz. Yes, uh, brothers and sisters. I'm uh, very pleased that uh, Brother Welsh, the union brother of mine, uh, got me uh, the information to come on to this today because I'm a, a big supporter of Paul Robeson uh, and personally a big supporter of Joseph Stalin as well. And so I, it was, I was extremely excited and, um, and um, I've heard Brother Fur speak before and I have great respect for the fact that he has been able to pierce some of the uh, the wall of uh, lies about Stalin and and maybe and and in this case about the great Paul Robeson, my hero. Uh, so uh, all all that's to the good, and I also agree with Brother Fur in his conclusion about what's needed in the world, what the world needs now is the international solidarity of the working class of the world. What we had under Stalin, uh, what we had when Robeson was the chief symbol of the struggle against fascism worldwide was that level of unity. And what I think the, the, the weakness, I, if I think there's a, a weakness in Brother Fur's work, and I have a lot of praise for his orientation, it is that it's an academic uh, what my my lack of praise is on the fact that I I think the the idea the strength is that he focuses on facts and in a world and in a U.S. where we have uh, Trump versus Biden uh, at at this point as, as the as choices um, the value of the truth you know Lenin said for the proletariat needs the truth and there's nothing so harmful to its cause as plausible, respectable, petty bourgeois lies. So what I was planning to do, even before Friedman got on, was to, was to raise a couple of old books, one by a, a, a great Jewish communist in the United States named M.J. Olgan. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to see if I, the pro- uh, We have reached the two minute limit oh, now. Okay, let me just give me a minute that, or half a minute. The proletarian revolution, uh, no, Trotskyism, counter-revolution in, in disguise. So I like uh, Brother Fur's use of, of Trotskyism the way, the way he used it. But also there was in 1956, when Khrushchev was first in power, in real power in the Soviet Union, and a lot of people, including Paul Robeson Jr., became an arch Khrushchevite, and that's a very important fact. In, in, in this situation. Okay, uh, Richard, thank you. At this okay, point, I'm, and I need to mention Anna Louise Strong. I need to mention Anna Louise Strong's book in 1950, The Stalin Era. Uh, somebody's interrupting Peter Berkowitz. Thank you for. Okay. All right, go ahead. Uh, if you have something to uh, uh, please respond, uh, Grover. Uh, no, I, you know, I, uh, I don't, I don't quite know what to say. Uh, those 
books uh, are were served a useful purpose in their day. Uh, we know a great deal more now about what uh, what uh, happened in the Soviet Union. Um, since the end of the Soviet Union, there's been this avalanche of uh, documents from former Soviet archives. Uh, that's a great source of uh, evidence to uh, discover what was really going on and, of course, to disprove uh, lies that have been told about Stalin and uh, other Communist Party leaders of his day and the Communists in general. And that's really what I've been doing. And if uh, it's true that there are limitations to what uh, academic studies can achieve. And uh, there's limitations to what anybody can achieve. Um, my work may be interesting to some people, maybe to many people, but uh, my hope is that at some time we will have the international, uh, you know, another kind of common turn, another kind of international communist movement. Uh, and uh, yeah, when that day comes, I hope that uh, my research will have been uh, useful to that movement. Uh, that will that will really make it uh, uh, much more important than it is now uh, in the absence of that kind of movement. But nevertheless, uh, academic work does uh, uh, does have a certain value uh, with all its limitations, and that's what I'm able to do. So that's why. I do. Okay, so I'm going to call on Ian and Kat. Uh, next. And by the way, uh, if your name is not coming sequentially, please hold on. I'll get to you. I have a method in my madness. So go ahead, Ian and Kat. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Mr. Fur, for all the work you've done for the international communist movement and certainly the communist movement in, in the West, um, just disposing of all these, you know, just outright lies against the uh, past socialist movements in the world. My question is regarding <clears throat> how you have managed to be so prolific in your writing, um, despite being a university professor. And my question actually rather is, um, you know, what would your advice be, if any, to um, younger people potentially who have an interest in going into teaching, whether it be in a public setting or in a university setting? Um, yeah, thanks so much and maintain their, maintaining their job. Thanks. <laughs> well, I, I assume you're asking me for advice for somebody who wants to research Soviet history. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, of course, you should learn the Russian language. That's very important. Um, I'm able to do what I do because I am not in the field of history. If I were in the field of history, I think I would not be able to, I would not have a, a university teaching career. Uh, so uh, I'm in the field of English literature. And so my job, my job security and, and so forth doesn't depend on uh, whether my research on Soviet history and on Stalin is uh, acceptable to the, <clears throat> to the authorities, the gatekeepers in the field of Soviet history. It certainly is not acceptable to them, but I'm able to do this. However, if I were in the field of history, I would not be able to do it. Um, so that's the situation that we're in. I mentioned that there is a, a small space in Russia itself for people who are, uh, you know, who don't follow the, the uh, anti-Stalin uh, orthodoxy. But it's a small space. Um, ne uh, maybe it's growing a little bit. I, it seems to me that it is, and that's all to the good. But outside of the Soviet, outside of Russia, there is no space in the field of Soviet history for anybody who is not relentlessly critical of communism and particularly of Stalin. Although there is a small space for Trotskyists, and uh, they occupy it. Um, that's the reality that we are in. Uh, and then, of course, I have um, 
I spend a great deal of time at this and I have done over many years. So um, uh, it's not something I do in my spare time. It's really something that I do full time. In a way, I do the teaching in the spare time. Uh, so it, it's, it is very time consuming. And, um, but I think that's true of research, of primary research in any field. Um, so I would encourage you to, you know, learn Russian and go as far as you can with this. And certainly stay in touch with me. If I could give you any help, I'd be glad to do it. Okay, so I would uh, uh, go to the next person. And what I'm going to do is those who, of us who are regulars on this program, I'll give them space later on. Let me give it uh, the initiative of questions or comments to those who are appearing for the first time. I hope those uh, who have raised their hands earlier would not mind. So F. Kempa would, is next in my uh, list, followed by Potter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, hello, Professor for, from Poland. Greetings uh, from Polish working class. And um, I have uh, some brief questions on your uh, research and uh, research plans in the future. Uh, what are you currently working on? Which What will be your uh, next book uh, published? And the second one is uh, about, as you claimed, uh, unfinished book about the Winter War. I mean, the Soviet Finnish War. Um, I found it on your on your page on the internet. And are you planning to to finish and, and publish in the near future? And the last one is about the so-called uh, Leningrad affair. Uh, are you will you cover it in in the future in your article, or maybe you done it uh, already, or maybe you're uh, recommending some some books or articles about it? Thank you. <clears throat> sure. Well, thanks a lot. Um... Glad to know you're in Poland. By the way, there's a, you know that there's a Polish translation of my book about the Katyn massacre. Did you know that? Yes, it is. It was uh, made by the Mark uh, Institute okay. Marx in Polish Marxist Institute. So somebody in, can, in right? translation. You can yeah, it is. It. You can download it. I just want to make sure that you know that. If you don't know how to download it, send me an email. I'll send you the link. Yeah, yeah I already done it. Okay. I have it on, on my PC. Very good. Okay, next book is going to be about the common turn conspiracy, um, centering on uh, Osip Chatnitsky, uh, the, the Trotskyite common turn conspiracy. It'll be out this summer. We don't have a title, um, but uh, my colleague Vladimir Bogrov in Moscow has attained uh, a large number of uh, primary source documents from the uh, former uh, NKVD files, and uh, they're very interesting. Uh, the Winter War uh, with Finland. Yeah, I was. The Winter War and your third question, the Leningrad Affair. So here's our, my present situation. Um, I was planning on doing uh, something on Finland. Uh, and uh, but there's this figure, important figure named Stephen Kotkin, who has a worldwide reputation. He's probably the uh, foremost authority in the world meaning uh, mainstream anti-communist authority on, uh, on Joseph Stalin. And he's written two huge volumes on Stalin's life up until 1941. Um, a few years ago when he published in 2017, he published his second volume called Stalin Waiting for Hitler. I researched and wrote a book published in 2019 called Stalin Waiting for the Truth in which I demonstrated that that Kotkin basically lied from one end of, the, of this enormous book to another. Um, Kotkin's third volume has been postponed and postponed and postponed. It was supposed to be published in 2022. Then it was postponed to 2024. Now it has most recently been postponed until 2025. Um, I have to, I feel that I have to keep myself prepared to sort of drop everything and dig into that book once it comes out. I thought it was gonna be this year, but I just learned last week, it's not gonna be until next year. Uh, the Leningrad Affair, of course, will be covered in, in that book. The, his Kotkin's third volume is gonna be Stalin from 1941 till his death, till 1953. Uh, so 
the Leningrad affair will will be covered in that. Um, I think just one thing, it's important to realize that Stalin works collectively. Stalin was not the dictator that the anti-communists and Trotskyists claim that he was. Um, and after the war, he was never well. Uh, it is not clear what role he played in many of these uh, post-World World War II um, uh, you know, crises or issues or events. Um, and the Soviet archives uh, for the period of the Leningrad affair are not yet open, just like they are not yet open for the period of the Jewish anti-fascist committee uh, trials. So, uh, you know, that's a, a, that's a problem. I have been concentrating on the 1930s and uh, I may take a foray into the 1940s uh, when Kutkin's book comes out, if it seems appropriate, but I'm not planning on shifting my, my area of focus to the 1940s. I'm, there's a lot of stuff in the 1930s that still needs to be done. Thanks for the question. Okay, so uh, following my methodology today, I'll go to Potter followed by Ruslan Akbarzadeh. So uh, then I'll come back to our regulars. Uh, and I, I promise you, everybody will get a chance. So actually, I called for Potter. Um, yeah. So, Can you yeah. guys hear me all right? Yeah. All right. So I'm here with, uh, you know, a few of oh, my Your sound is a little bit rough. Your sound is yeah. a bit rough. Do you, is your microphone plugged in? Uh, is this any better? Okay, that's, that's, that's better. better. Yeah. All right. Sorry. So yeah, I'm watching here with a organization, Communist the Workers and Students for Social Change in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you very much for the talk and for the work you're doing. It's really excellent. Um, my question was, you know, uh, sort of some of the other comrades alluded to, right, in this age of constant misinformation and, and lies, you know, people uh, spread, you know, the most extreme vitriol and stuff. Uh, if you have any advice on how to essentially combat some of that, how to point people towards your work. Because if, if you look online, you know, you'll get accused by the revisionist of, of being a revisionist, you know, and they'll just kind of say, oh, this is the same as like denying the Holocaust. This is the same as a bunch of other wild conspiracy theories. Um, and how do we, you know, kind of point them in the right direction without, because, you know, these people might not necessarily be willing to engage in like, oh, let's take a look at an academic book. Let's take, you know, look at primary sources, but how to kind of combat that, how to start pointing them in the right direction, um, or in, in at least in like a more neutral setting and uh, disarm some of these, you know, again, wild accusations, conspiracy and lies that the, the mainstream media will prop up. Uh, thank you very much. Sure, um, that's a big question. And the, I guess there's no simple answer, but let me try to give you a simple answer anyway. Um, always ask for evidence. No statement that is made without evidence deserves to be, uh, and me, let me put it this way. No sta a statement that is made without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. If somebody makes some sort of claim about Stalin or the Soviet Union or communism or, um, and has no evidence to support it, just say, well, if you don't have any evidence, then there, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't go around believing it. There's a definition. I think it comes from Carl Sagan, the uh, the physicist. He was a you know uh, a famous, probably before your time, but a very famous figure in American physics, who made a, who said at one time that uh, faith is belief without evidence. And scholars, scientists, historians, and of course he was talking about physicists, have no business making statements based on faith. You should make statements based on evidence. And there's no shame. In fact, it's a it's necessary skill to get used to saying, I don't know. Okay, if you don't have the evidence, you have to, to say, 
I don't know. I need to see the evidence. Many, many people in our society have been miseducated to not understand that, okay? We need evidence. It's not a question of believing authority. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, the Soviet history is dominated by anti-communists. And, you know, we all have heard about anti-communism. We've heard about the Cold War. We've heard about anti-communist law. You can't believe what these people say. Well, you shouldn't believe it anyway. What is their evidence? Um, now, uh, thirdly, uh, if if uh, if people are not serious enough about this these issues to be willing to read a book, then I don't know. There's maybe you shouldn't spend too much time with those people. Their their objections are perhaps not worth very much. Um, but I've written a number of books. Uh, if you if if you were to recommend my book, Stalin Waiting for the Truth, which is a, a point by point, page by page uh, demonstration that Stephen Kotkin's 1100 page uh, second volume biography of Stalin is full of falsehoods from beginning to end, phony evidence and bad reasoning. Uh, it's quite typical, okay? So, um, uh, other than that, other than stressing evidence and maybe suggesting that people go and read one or two examples of what evidence-based research really looks like, direct them towards my stuff if you wanted to. Um, other than that, I, I, I don't think there is a, a, a solution. And remember Carl Sagan, okay? Faith is belief without evidence. Don't believe without evidence. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor, for, for the answer. Okay, so Ruslan Akbarzadi is next. Yeah, Ruslan Akbarzadi, please uh, unmute yourself. Okay, um, I don't. Uh, did he go away? Okay, he's not here. Okay, then we'll go to. Somebody who identifies as test. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, please identify your name uh, before you, and you're, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, so my name is Tom. Uh, hello, Mr. Four. It's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, I saw you in the interview of my French organization in November. Yes. Uh, and uh, my question is about revisionism. Uh, Mao spoke of a cultural revolution in order to fight against revisionism. And so my question is, therefore, what were Stalin's measures uh, so has to fight against revisionism. Revisionism, is that what you said? Yes. Okay, not religion. You're not talking about religion. So, 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 sorry, my English is a, a little bit uh, yes, complicated. Yes, revisionism, is that what you yes. mean? Revisionism. Well, I mean, the revisionism of Stalin's day was primarily uh, the, the social democrats and um, which included, which, and the socialist revolutionaries who had a big base in the countryside. And of course, the Trotskyists, that was, that was, that was revisionism of, of Stalin's day. I understand that um, uh, that seems antiquated, but the fact of the matter is that if you take a look at revisionism today, however you look at it, uh, the uh, to, in my experience, today's revisionism uh, begins with uh, lies about the Soviet Union during the Stalin period. I mean, the Stalin period is in some sense, in the Soviet Union is in some sense, a the pivotal issue of understanding uh, world history in the 20th century. It is when, when World War II ended, the Soviet Union was victorious. Stalin was probably, I, I would say most likely, the most popular man in the entire world. There is an enormous movement behind him. And there has been tremendous 
expensive effort made since World War II to, to uh, denigrate, to blacken, to, to, to drag down the image of the Soviet Union during the 1930s. And it's infected um, all other socialist groups, all of the groups that, re that regard themselves as socialist. Um, uh, the social, I, I beat up on the Trotskyists here and that's my talk here because I think that they perform a very, very negative function, but the social Democrats uh, and other people who might be, uh, who, are, who, are, who are dismayed and disgusted by the, um, the horrors of capitalism. So I think it's fundamental to convincing people to, um, to look to uh, a communist future and to organize for it, uh, to fight uh, uh, the, uh, the lies about the Soviet Union during the Stalin period. That's what I try to do. Um, other than that, I'm not, I think that's the best answer I could give to your question. Thank you. All right, so next to I will go to all uh, our regular thanks for your patience for waiting. I'll go to our regulars afterwards. Uh, is Robert and Emmanuel Ness. So Robert, please go ahead. You have to unmute yourself, Robert. Uh, did we lose? Hi, you mean you mean me? Yeah, Robert. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, fine. No, I just I just wanted to add to uh, uh, Professor Fur's answer to my my previous question, which is that I regard Stalin as a great intellectual myself, okay. and what I recommend for people to read something not too uh, long is his essay, Dialectical and Historical Materialism, okay. which which is an excellent elaboration of Marx's preface to uh, a critique of political economy. So, uh, so that's what I wanted to add there, that's all. He has a brilliant uh, explanation of, of uh, political economy in general in a historical sense. Thank you. That okay. essay, thanks for your question. That essay, for your remark, um, don't forget uh, Jeffrey Roberts' book on Solomon's Library, however. Um, yeah. So that essay can be criticized uh, because of its omission of the category of the negation of the negation. Um, Stalin based himself, and I, and I think there's a, there's a kind of answer to that critique. Uh, Stalin based himself basically on Lenin's writings. Lenin writes about the negation of the negation, as far as I know, only in his philosophical notebooks. And uh, they were not published uh, for quite a few years after, uh, after Lenin's death. Um, the uh, Engels, I think, uh, wrote about the negation of the negation. Uh, Marx, of course, never wrote his textbook on dialectics, right? Uh, Engels wrote about dialectics, but Mar uh, Stalin based himself mainly on almost exclusively on Lenin. So that uh, Lenin said very little about the negation of the negation. And I think it was mainly only in his philosophical notebooks, which were little known in, in that time. Uh, so Stalin didn't write about it. Uh, that having been said, that whole book, The History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Short Course, which includes the chapter on the dialectical materialism, which was evidently written by Stalin, uh, is, is an important work. I agree. Okay, Emmanuel Ness is next. Please, Emmanuel, go ahead. Uh, thank you. It's uh, great to see you again, Grover. Um, nice to see you, man. I have uh, two very brief questions. The first is, I think there is an effort to disprove what Stalin has done, that you've done brilliantly, and I commend you on that. And uh, what he hasn't done, but what he has done, I think, is something that is not advanced by many scholars. So, for instance, uh, the development of 
and international uh, comment turn and so forth was mm -hmm. ad advanced by Stalin and so forth. So I'm going to stop there because I don't want to take up too much time. The, the, the second point would be, what, did, what do you think of the Ukrainian claims today of the Holomador and their use of it as a form of advancing a uh, form of fascism or Nazism? Mm -hmm. And uh, what should we do with respect to the you know, since it's a contemporary uh, period with respect to the war or special military operation, uh, however you want to call it, what would be the proper left position from a Stalinist perspective? I'm not. Uh, the common turn, yeah, we need a common turn, but of course we need a national communist movement. We don't have one at this point. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff on the Holodomor. Uh, if you accept, if you set um, Anne Applebaum aside, and she is not really a scholar of the Soviet Union in normal sense, uh, if you accept her, set, set her aside, uh, no Western scholar accepts the concept of the Holodomor. It is really accepted only by the, only by the, uh, well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe one Italian scholar accepts it, but, um, it's a it's a a matter of of faith for the Ukrainian uh, nationalists that there that there was this deliberate starvation, and uh, there's very good scholarship to disprove it. But the uh, the, the Ukrainian nationalists uh, have done a, a pretty good job of uh, leapfrogging over the scholarly community and going straight to uh, semi popular and popular media to spread the myth of the Holodomor. And um, so it's it's uh, widely believed. And uh, I've had a few occasions when I've talked to people and people have asked me about it. I've said, well, you know, it's it's uh, completely false uh, and it's been disproven a number of times. And I've summarized Mark Tauger's works and some of my books and so forth. Um, I think it's hard for many people to believe that the um, a, a something that's taken as so widely assumed to be factual can be in, uh, in reality false. But yes, uh, Tauger's works, uh, a couple of chapters in my book, Blood Lies, one chapter in my book, Stalin Waiting for the Truth. Um, I've never read a, uh, a Western scholar who uh, accepts the idea of the Holodomor. Even, even Robert Conquest withdrew uh, his uh, analysis that he put forth in that book, Harvest of Sorum. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just, just have to be prepared to tell people that and to point them to some facts. But yes, the what happened was, as I'm sure you're aware, that uh, once, uh, Ukraine became independent at the end of the 80s. Uh, the uh, right-wing Ukrainians who had been allied with the Nazis and, and their followers uh, flooded back to Ukraine and took over uh, much of the cultural and educational apparatus of the new Ukrainian state. And they have made uh, the Holodomor into a, uh, an institution where if in your Ukraine, you have, to, you have to agree with it. And they're pretty powerful in some other Western Western countries too, like uh, Canada, the Germany, um, less so uh, elsewhere. There's a Ukrainian Institute at Harvard, but Harvard doesn't fund it. It's funded by Ukrainian nationalists. They just like the name uh, Harvard attached to their to their uh, institute. Uh, I think that's about. I think that you know turning people on to some of these materials if they're interested in that question is the only thing you can you can really do. Um, I don't have, I mean, I, uh, the war in Ukraine, I mean, this is, this, I'm not a political pundit. I, I think that John Mearsheimer is, who is a, uh, an international relations expert at the University of Chicago, uh, has explained this very clearly. Um, the war in Ukraine was, is basically stimulated by 
by the United States and NATO and um, the Ukrainian government is propped up by them and they do, they have been doing what the United States and NATO want them to do. And um, it was an attempt to uh, make Ukraine a member of NATO, make Ukraine an armed camp on, the, on Russia's borders. And it was predictable. I mean, Mearsheimer predicted it 10 years in advance that this is, there's going to be a war over this if NATO continues to encroach to get closer and closer to Russia. So it's part of this big power struggle. You know, it, it's part of the uh, international big power competition. You've got three major powers now, not just the United States, but which was just the United States for at least 20 years after the fall of the Soviet Union. But it's now you've got China and the United States and Russia as a third, uh, the weakest of the three, but still a major, uh, major world power, a, a nuclear power. And uh, this is uh, the United States using NATO and the Ukrainians, Ukrainians as, as cannon fodder, really, to uh, try to weaken Russia. And uh, it doesn't seem like it's working, but uh, it's a very dangerous situation. And um, uh, I've been interested and disappointed, of course, but interested to see that uh, Russian studies institutes around the, uh, in Western Europe and in the United States uh, have unanimously decided to support Ukraine. That is, they're supporting NATO and the United States. And there's just no evidence for uh, that Russia wanted to take over Ukraine. There's no evidence that uh, uh, that uh, Putin is a, an imperialist in that sense. Um, it's a, this is a war that that really was was uh, planned and and is being carried out by the United States and NATO. And you know the the government of Ukraine is uh, is is complicit completely, and it's leading to the destruction of uh, of this country and an enormous number of deaths. It's a demonstration of how how terrible uh, interimperance rivalry is uh, under capitalism. You know, it reminds you of the pre-World War I period. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrible situation, but that's, that's, that's my understanding of it. That's, I don't claim to be any kind of independent. Okay, so I'm gonna go two more people who are new to our forum. And I appreciate the patience of our regulars. Um, so, but we will extend the session with everybody's permission here by the time so that we cover all these five people, the last five people, uh, so which include Janet, Norma, and Yusuf, who are our regulars. So next person I'll go to is Ruslan Akbarzadeh, who had raised his hand long ago, but then I couldn't find him. He's back. Ruslan, please go ahead. And then followed by him would be Manu. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I apologize for the description for it has uh, occurred it. First of yeah. all, thank you very much, Mr. Grover, for, for your narration. By the way, Professor, I apologize in advance if I say the wrong thing because I'm a little excited. Yeah, my question is, uh, Mr. Ford. Do you define the post-Stalin Soviet period as socialist, imper social imperialist? According to Hoje's sources, capitalism was built in the Soviet Union in 1960, and Ernst Aust, a German Hojeist, calls Brezhnev today's Hitler. What are your thoughts on this subject? My question is this. Thank you. What exactly? I, I didn't quite understand your question. Could you try to state it one more time? You're asking uh, me my opinion of whether whether the Soviet Union was social imperialist in 1960. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Was the Soviet Union social imperialist in 1960? Well, the Chinese said it was. Uh, I have never really investigated uh, the question. The Chinese uh, Central Committee of the Chinese Communist, well, actually, the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party, probably Mao Zedong and his closest followers, you know, had the Sino-Soviet dispute, which is a, important. Uh, ideological uh, discussion and exposure of of um, uh, 
of the ways in which the Soviet Union was turning away from what the Chinese, I think, rightly saw as the path towards uh, socialism and communism. Um, so it's an important uh, dispute to discuss, and there were many documents in it. Uh, the Chinese began to call, Mao began to call the Soviets social imperialist. As I remember, what he meant by that was socialist in name, but imperialist in, um, in, in essence. Uh, but I have never investigated exactly what that concept means or, or how you would demonstrate it with respect to the Soviet Union. I, I know that the Chinese were, were uh, in part impelled to do this by Khrushchev's speech. They really disagreed with Khrushchev's speech. They didn't know what Stalin had really done and had not really done because of course we, they didn't have the evidence that we have today. But they recognized in the late 50s, the Chinese leadership recognized in the late 50s that Khrushchev was using the attack on Stalin to turn away from, you know, what you might recall, you might regard as the Stalin method of building socialism, which by the way, the Chinese were more or less following with some, you know, some adaptations, but the Chinese were, you know, first collective agriculture and then industrialized without uh, foreign uh, investment. Uh, and their criticisms of the Soviet Union got to the point whereby in I guess it was 1959, Khrushchev just pulled out all of the Soviet aid. The Soviet Union had given tremendous aid to China, as you know, to uh, build industries and design plants and, and, and uh, design infrastructure. Um, and uh, Khrushchev just put it into all of that. So of course that was an abandonment of, of uh, proletarian internationalism. As far as Mao was concerned, that meant that uh, the Soviets were no longer uh, a socialist country meaning they were turning away from major, major preconditions for uh, socialism. Now, after Mao died, uh, the Chinese leadership reversed that view. They reversed a lot of things that Mao, that were done under Mao Zedong. And uh, they reversed that view and uh, uh, retracted the criticisms of Khrushchev's speech and the, and the uh, and the Soviet policies and so forth, and then after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, came to an end in the 1991, uh, the Chinese, I think, in a kind of hesitant way, uh, reversed themselves again. They didn't go back and reassert what. Uh, what uh, the, the uh, Chinese leadership had said during, uh, uh, under Mao in the early 60s, but they did change their evaluation of uh, at least of, of Gorbachev. And so this is a big, uh, to my per personal knowledge, because I know a couple of these people in Beijing, uh, this is a big issue of concern to uh, people at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences to try to understand what uh, what were the uh, processes going on inside the Soviet Union? They're very interested in that question. And of course, we're all interested in that question. That's a very important question. But more than that, I can't tell you because I have concentrated my efforts on the Soviet, Soviet history in the 1930s. And I don't know, I don't claim to have any particular specialized knowledge about Soviet policies uh, in the 50s and 60s. So I apologize if that's not much of an answer, but it's the best I can. Okay, thank you. Manuel uh, Santoro is next. All right. Oh, good afternoon, uh, Grover Four. Thank you for your uh, lecture today. Hi, can you hi. hear me by the way? We can hear you a little bit muffled. Can you bring yourself closer to the microphone? Yeah, I'm actually close to the PC. It doesn't work very much, but I will try. So um, I'm actually from, uh, from Italy. Uh, I'm uh, part of the Red School. We mm -hmm. try to teach Marxism, Leninism here mm -hmm. in part of uh, Europe. And my question is about, the, if you, Grover, could elaborate 
a little bit uh, about the, when Stalin tried to um, resign from the party four times, I believe, starting from 1924. Yeah. And the reason why uh, he wanted to leave actually the leadership of the political party. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's, depends on how you count them. You know, Stalin tried to resign three times in the, in the 20s uh, and then several times uh, after that. But um, why did he try to resign? Um, well, what he said was at first he wanted to resign because he couldn't stand Trotsky. He, couldn't, he just couldn't. He said, I can't work with this man. Uh, but they wouldn't accept him to resign. And then after a while, he said, uh, this is in the late 20s, he said, uh, uh, we've defeated the opposition. The opposition is, uh, has been routed. They are bad politics. You know, they're, they're bad politics have been defeated. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, he would, he, he said, this is a good time for me to resign um, because he had saw himself at that point as somebody who was leading the ideological struggle against the opposition, but his uh, his resignation was not accepted. Um, I don't remember the specifics. I do know that in 1921, at the Tenth Party Congress, he was elected to be, or he's chosen to be, the General Secretary. But in the at the Seventeenth Party Congress in 1934. Uh, suddenly the title of general secretary disappears. It's no longer there. Stalin is just one of the secretaries. And uh, nobody's, I'm not aware that uh, this was a formal decision of the Politburo or, or the Central Committee, but uh, Stalin refused to call himself general secretary thereafter. But no sooner did Stalin die then uh, the title was brought back and Khrushchev started calling himself general secretary again. Stalin, uh, contrary to what many people, what we've all heard, Stalin did not uh, like the cult of personality around himself, the cult of the individual. He, uh, I go into this in, in my book, Khrushchev Lied, which is available in Italian. Uh, Manuel, I'm sure you know that. Um, Stalin was against the cult of personality. And I think that uh, his offers to retire, his desires to retire uh, should be seen in that light. And then finally, at the um, 19th Party Congress in uh, October, 1952, Stalin spoke and he said that he wanted to retire. He was sick, he was old, he was sick. He would die in five months. He was sick, he was old. He said, I do not read papers anymore. I want to retire. And there was this big outcry from, you know, the party officials there. No, no, we don't want you to retire. And once again, he agreed, he, he um, uh, you know, acquiesced to this, uh, to the requests of the uh, party leadership. So Stalin also saw himself as working as a collective. Uh, he was somebody who saw himself as working collectively. Uh, shortly, some shortly after Stalin died, there's this document which I put in one of the articles I wrote. It's on my web page. I can't remember which one. The CIA issued a report, which has since been been published, uh, right. stating that um, nothing much was going to change after Stalin died. Of course, they were wrong about that. But they said nothing much is going to change in the Soviet leadership. Uh, they said the um, uh, the the idea that that that, there, that was this was a one man dictatorship has been overblown. It was always a collective dis, uh, leadership, even under Stalin, and it would continue to be a collective leadership. So I think that the answer to your question lies in that area that Stalin was opposed to the uh, cult of personality, to this uh, and uh, the cult of the great Stalin, and that he uh, saw himself as working collectively as having. Uh, his loyalty was to the party and everybody's loyalty should be to the party and not for not to him, not to him personally.
I hope that's helpful. Okay, so one more new person, and then our three regular ones. I, I, if you do it, guys, don't get a chance because we're already 10 minutes past the top, closing time. Five more minutes. So Ryan is has not spoken. He's new to our forum. Ryan, please go ahead. Ryan? Okay. I'm coming. Ryan. Hold on. Okay. He's coming. I had to unmute. Um, thanks, Professor uh, Fear. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of your stuff, and you have a a good following amongst the Marxist Leninists in Minneapolis. Um, I just uh, I had a, two questions, but I think the answers are brief. Um, one is: Have any uh, Trotskyist intellectuals or scholars been interested in your work and in maybe having a public debate or anything? And uh, my second question, kind of piggybacking on one earlier, is uh, do you have any thoughts on the Stalinism of Inver Hoxha? And I don't mean Stalinism pejoratively, mm -hmm. just his work. Never, so, I've never Thank studied you. Inver Hoxha's works. I don't have anything to say about them. I just have not done that. You know, there's only so many hours in the day and you make your choices to what to do research on and you have to exclude all kinds of other important issues. I hope somebody learns Albanian and uh, and digs into that legacy, but uh, I have not done that. Um, no, uh, Trotskyists uh, avoid avoid uh, me, uh, or uh, let us say most of the time and on the few occasions when that has not been the case, uh, they've made wild, um, wildly inaccurate and even defamatory and certainly very ignorant statements it's um it's a fact and i keep looking for evidence to the contrary but i i don't think there are any good trotsky scholars i think that they that they don't they just don't look for the evidence when it comes to stalin and it comes to trotsky they just ignore the evidence that exists that i've written about uh i'm not saying that trotskyists can't write uh good stuff about other subjects you know, no doubt uh, they could uh, perhaps, but when it comes to when it comes to Soviet politics, when it comes to Soviet Union, when it comes to Stalin and Trotsky, Trotskyists uh, are uh, just just ignore the evidence and make stuff up. I just got another book. God, I just got another book by Jean Jean Jacques Marie, a French, the, the leading Trotskyist scholar in the world, as I have been told by other Trotskyists, on uh, how Stalin, you know, was a friend of Hitler's. And uh, just glancing through it, uh, it's just it's just terrible. I mean, this guy just 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 ignores the scholarship and, and the evidence that exists. So no, I don't I don't think that any Trotskyists are about to to engage in, in debates uh, with me. Not because there's anything great about me, but I mean, the one thing that is great about me, if you want to look at it that way, it could be great about all of you. I hope it is. I look for the evidence. Hey, what's your evidence to make these statements? And uh, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. That's kind of what Galileo said to the Pope, right? You know, you say, the Pope said, well, you know, the, the sun revolves around the earth. And Galileo said, well, the, the evidence says you're wrong. <laughs> That's it. You may be the Pope. You may be a great authority. And all of the princes and potentates of Europe may agree with you. But the evidence says you're wrong. And Remember he, the, Galileo's famous words as he as he he said, "Okay, okay, don't torture me. I'll agree." And he supposedly walked out of the room and he said, "Appears in more way." I said, "It moves. It it moves anyway. That means the the Earth is not stationary at the center of the universe. It moves around the sun." He says, "It moves anyway. No matter what I say, no matter what you force me to say, and no matter what you say, it moves anyway. That's evidence is primary. Okay, evidence is primary. Thank you for okay, your question." So Okay, so now I have a challenge here. Three people, and we have two minutes, which has we extended the time as much as we could. So how do we do three minutes? Let's I'll ask Janet to quickly ask one question, and then Norma to say something quickly, and then Yusuf. Everybody, kind of rush through it. Uh, Janet, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Grover. Good to see you again. Uh, let me comment that, like Stalin, Putin is being demonized and lied about by the West, as yep. well as by Trotskyists. 
as having imperialist aspirations, while in March of 2023, ICC prosecutor and Western puppet Karim Khan issued arrest warrants for Putin and other Russian officials for kidnapping Ukrainian children and other crimes. Russia has been amassing documentation of Ukrainian war crimes and genocide against the people of, in the Donbass since 2014 and reporting it to the UN, UN. Given that the UN is a tool of the West, it is unlikely Russia would ever get a fair hearing at the ICJ. That said, there is evidence that Russia plans to hold trials. I assume once the SMO or the war with NATO ends, and no doubt they will be called show trials by the collective West. I believe the material will be made public. We also have the FBI case against the Uhuru Three of the African People's Socialist Party unjustifiably accusing their speech as actions taken under the influence of a Russian agent and thus trying to silence and marginalize them. Okay. The way, yeah, trial, I, I'm just, done. I'm almost done. Their, their trial is set to begin on September 3rd in Tampa, Florida. And I'm wondering whether you would care to com comment on any of that. Let's move on to the other, thank you. Let's move yeah. on to the other. Norma? I put my note into the chat. Okay. Uh, I copy the chat. If you want a copy, I'll also put my email address in there and I can send it to you. Thank you. The, the, comment, the comment, of course, is that the states that we think are communist are communist. That is, uh, they're, they're sticking to principles of, that we want to support. And thank you, Janet, for getting all that great content in. Yeah, OK. Uh, so shall I just go ask uh, uh, Yusuf to make his comments quickly? Yeah. Okay, you said please go ahead. Um, no, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I missed your talk uh, because of some political activity. Uh, but uh, I caught uh, your comment. Uh, well, uh, something happened, and uh, the uh, study of Marxism Leninism uh, sort of went away to that effect. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, are you aware, uh, um, somebody you know, uh, Wadi Halabi uh, attributes that uh, to uh, the, the the lack of distinction that, was in, that uh, the government work and party work, uh, the separation, uh, there was no separation for certain reasons. It, it got all tangled up and basically the government side won out that people were concerned with uh, governance uh, making uh, uh, something work rather than uh, ideology basically uh, so he has a whole theory of that are you aware of that and uh, what no, do you I'd think like of to see. i'd like to read it uh, I, i'm not aware okay so i think with that we have to end the session thank you professor fur uh, it is very exciting, and you broke all records. We had 100 people here today, and as you have been breaking records and on a YouTube channel as well, you're by far the most watched program on our uh, that we have produced. So you'll thank send you. Us the, you send us the link, right? I'm sorry? You'll send us the link to the uh, YouTube. I would, yeah. definitely. It'll thank be, you for having be, it's been a great honor and a great privilege, and I really appreciate all of you attending. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Okay, thank you all. Uh, bye bye. And I'm going to close the Zoom now. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat, 
at our in-person forums. Please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S U N D A Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F A L L E N B A U M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or di- directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml info for information write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org